How do I know? I know because I was restless. How do I know? Because I was wild. Because I was addicted. I was lost. Because I was empty. I know because I was living behind a mask. How do I know Jesus is alive? Because he lives in me. Jesus did what no one else could do for me. He took the punishment for my failures, my wrong decisions, my selfishness, my pride, and my sin. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was tortured. Crucified. And buried for me. But on the third day, he did exactly what he said he would do. Jesus rose up and walked right out of the tomb. And in the summer of 1985, July of 2007, February 2005, June 2003, and in August 1995, he walked into my life. And I've never been the same since. Now I am truly living. Now I am sober. I am at peace. I am fulfilled. Now I am free. Now I am found. My God. My Savior. My best friend. My Lord. My Jesus. Is alive. The tomb may be empty, but my heart is full. He takes us and restores us and rebuilds us and makes us fully alive again. Isn't that wonderful? It's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me in July of 1974. When was your day when you first encountered the grace of God and knew that you were loved infinitely, eternally by the Lord God Almighty? You put a date there? You have a moment there where you go, wow, I, I remember when he first became real to me. I appreciated Scott's comments this morning because what happens when you walk where Jesus walked is that there's a new reality. There's a new sense of the realness of it. And what happens when we take communion? There's a sense of the realness of it, isn't there? It's real. He died and rose again. It's real. He died for me. He died for you. And we celebrate that this morning. And I just want to encourage you to, uh, to join us in this second part of the journey. We get to live on purpose again this week. And then the rest of it's up to you and Steve to decide because he's putting me away again. So I get, you know, I get unlocked for a couple of weeks and then he goes, okay, back in the room, lock the door. Okay, you got to stay there. <laughs> That's not true, but, um, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to, um, to share with you this morning and to, to really remind you that our kids this last week, two weeks ago, our kids were in BBS all week long and this little wristband, and I mean little because it's cutting off the circulation, says a special agent for the one true God. I'm a special agent for the one true God. All your kids got that in BBS. 483 kids got it and get that and know that we're on special assignment from God. And I hope that they never lose that. I hope that they get that and stay with that and understand that and put that into place in their lives, especially when they're growing up as young people and teenagers into adult life. They'd remember their special agents on assignment for the one true God. Because that's what we're talking about this morning, about living on purpose. That reality that we live on purpose because God has brought us into this relationship with himself through his son. And that relationship is so important to us because we're part of the supernatural mission of Christ, aren't we? That's what we're part of. That's what our kids learn in BBS. Can I take this off now? <laughs> but what an awesome thing our kids get to remember, that they're special agents on assignment from God, the one true God. 
And so this morning, I just want to remind you where we were last week. We talked about the reality of who we are in Christ and who Christ is in our lives. And I want to ask you to remember with me the reality that God is at work in our lives, that we talked about this supernatural thing. And all of it is from God, this supernatural reality that we live. It's from God. It's not from us. It's not like we made this stuff up. It's not like we can manufacture this on our own. This is a God-working reality in every person's life who calls himself a Christ follower, a Christian, right? God is working in our lives. It's supernatural. And the ways he does that are amazing. And last week, we talked about three of those things. There's a, there's a supernatural love from God that compels us to live, doesn't it? It controls our lives because Jesus came and lived and died and rose so the love of God could become a reality in your life. And he sent back the Spirit so that that love could dwell within us and we would be fully alive by the love of God. And then we have a supernatural lordship. The rightful king has returned, doesn't he? When Jesus took over this position as Lord, when he, when he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth, when he claimed that reality, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord, and when he was restored to that position of glory that he had before the foundation of the world, we have the rightful king of our lives in a place that he needs to be. And that's where we need to submit to him as Lord. And so we're surrendered to his lordship. And then finally, we get to be born again into his life. That's the reality we live in. And that is what I want to challenge you to think about this morning. As we begin this journey into the next part of the story in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, into the first part of chapter 6, this story continues to be supernatural. It's not just that God begins this work in us by his love and that he comes as Lord and says, let, surrender your life to me and let me move your life, let me make your life into what you, I created it to be in the first place. And let my life be in you. Let Become a new creation in Christ a fresh working of God that goes on inside of us. But then he goes on to say, what does that look like? How does that play out from then on as we become new people in Christ? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through, 20, through, through uh, 6, 2 is where we're going to go this morning. We're just going to talk about the next part of that reality. And so I want to encourage you this morning to look at this reality. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As Paul writes to these believers who they know they're now in a supernatural love relationship with God. They know that the rightful king is in place. They know that they're a new creation in Christ. And then he says this to them. All this is from God. It is amazing that our God loves us that much. It is amazing that our God wants to restore us that badly. It's amazing that he would go to the cross for us because we matter to him more than life. He created us to be children of the Most High God, and when we're separated from Him, we're not in a place where He created us to be. And so He says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You see, that's the picture that God has for us. We are transformed by this supernatural ministry of God to our lives. And I want to ask you this morning to consider this reality, the redemption of our lives, this reconciliation process, being brought from a position of being at odds with God to being his very children is an amazing work of God. Last week, we looked at Romans chapter 5, where Paul says, we are helpless, we are sinners, we are enemies of God. We are people who are powerless to change our lives. We're ungodly, and yet God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still in that condition, Christ died for me. Christ died for you. He died for the world, not when we had our lives together, but because we didn't, precisely because we couldn't. And that's what reconciliation is about. It's about God moving us relationally from this position of being enemies of God, being lost and not able to contain our lives, not able to change our lives in any way, shape, or form into the people God wants us to be. And he did it for us so we could be restored to this relationship with our Father in heaven. Reconciliation. Paul is the only New Testament writer that uses the noun, katalaje, and the verb katalaso, the basic idea is to change or make otherwise. In Greek and social spheres, political spheres, the term denoted the change in relations. In relationships, did you get that? A change in relationships between individuals or groups or nations where while in the religious arena it was used in relationship between gods and humans, in Paul's writings, God is always the reconciler. Those in need of reconciliation are the hostile human beings, are people who are at odds with God's purpose or plan for their lives. And you, you might say, well, I was never hostile toward him. I just didn't pay attention. 
I just live for myself. Well, isn't that hostile toward the purpose of God? To leave him out of your life experience? To say, I don't want you in my life. I'd rather do it my way. Thank you very much. You see, God is in the purpose of reconciling us because we matter to him. And I want to ask you this morning, do you have relationships in your life that need reconciled? Do you have people in your life that are hard to get along with, that you feel a a schism between you and them? Do you have marital issues or family issues or relational issues with people at work or whatever it is in your life? Because if there are relationships in your life, and I believe there are in every person's life in this world and every person's life in this room, that we have relationships that it requires the grace of God and the, and the forgiveness of God to restore, right? And so here's my question for you. If you're not reconciled to God and you have not experienced his grace, if you're not reconciled to God and you haven't come to faith and understood his forgiveness for you, how in the world can you reconcile with other people? You see, unless we understand that reconciliation comes to us from God, it cannot move, move through us from God. And I think that's what Paul is trying to say to these people. You were reconciled at the cross. God did a work of reconciliation. And then he gives you a ministry to extend that into your life experience. You see, what God does to you in reconciling you from a position of being enemies to being friends, and not only being friends, but being sons and daughters of God, when God does that work in your life, he gives you the capacity by his grace and because of his forgiveness to extend that into relationships in real life. Without that, it's impossible. I don't believe it's possible for us to reconcile without the reconciliation that we've received from God himself. And so Paul says, God in Christ was reconciling the entire world to himself. And I just want to ask you to think about that. In Romans chapter 1, Paul describes our condition without Christ. And I just want to read you two verses out of that. In verses 23 and 24, listen to what he said. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Verse 22. And exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among them, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. You see, we put ourselves at odd with God when we said we want to do it our way. We want to worship and serve the created things. We want to worship and serve ourselves. We want to live to please us, not to please you. And that puts us at odds with God. And, that, and you realize that all the rest of Romans chapter 1 is a description of the losses and the perversions and the death and destruction that comes as a result of leaving God out of your life. And I want to ask you this morning, have you received the reconciliation that God our Father through Jesus his Son has offered you as a supernatural ministry to your life to restore you to life to restore you to this position, to restore you to a relationship with himself so that through your life, God can extend that ministry to other people in your world, in your family, in your marriage, with your children, with your parents. You see, the God of the universe is so concerned about us in right relationships, he is willing to say, I'd rather die for you than be without you. I love Ephesians chapter chapter 2 because it so aptly describes this reality of our condition and what God does for us in reconciling us. Let me just read it with you. Watch on the screen. And he starts with these words, and you were dead. Say it with me. And you were dead. All of us were dead one time. You know, the prodigal son returns home and the father says, the father who is God, our father says, My son was dead and now he's alive again. My son was lost and now he's found. He was dead, right? The stories we heard this morning were about people who have come to life and they're fully alive and they're speaking life out of their own experience with other people. They're speaking life to other people because they've received life from God himself. And I just want to ask you this morning to consider that reality. And you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once lived, and the passions of our flesh, carrying the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were on the wrong side of God. We were on the wrong side of the God of the universe because we chose a course of sinfulness that that has come down through the history of our world when the enemy of our souls continues to tempt us, like we talked about last week in part one, with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, right? 
by nature children of wrath like the rest. Look at how it goes on. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. God loved you more than your sin. He loved you more than the separation. He loved you more than life. And that's the love of our Father in heaven. That's the love that was demonstrated through the cross. Even when we were dead in our our trespasses, yes, thank you very much, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He gave us a new life and he gave us a new perspective. He raised us up out of the muck and the mire of our sin and our selfishness, and he raised us up above that to look down and say, I have been redeemed from that lifestyle, from that stuff that was holding me back, that that, that temptation and that struggle and that sin that the enemy of my soul has kept me captive in. Jesus set me free. It's an act of grace that freed us from sin. It's an act of grace that changes our lives. Look at the next part. So that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The immeasurable riches of his grace. Let me ask you something. When you think about what Jesus died for on the cross, and you think about every sin in your particular life, is it measurable? You can't even count them all. You don't even know them all. You don't even remember all of them, probably. Some of us, right? But the reality is immeasurable riches means that not only are all the sins of your life under the blood of Jesus Christ, but all the sins of every other person in this room are under the blood of Jesus Christ. And every sin of every person on the planet was given, his, he gave his life to become sin for them so they could become the righteous of God in Christ. If by faith they would choose that, right? So he says this, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God, not as a result of works, that, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then he says this, therefore remember, at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, how many of us are Gentiles in the flesh? Raise your hands. Almost all of us here, okay? If there's any Jews, Jewish heritage, you don't have to raise your hands right now, but you will. Called circ- the circumcision by what is called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was our condition before Jesus. We were outside of the covenants of God, outside of this relationship with God, outside of this position of relationship with him as our Father in heaven, which by grace through faith we receive and come into this new relationship with God based on his goodness and grace toward us. Look what else he says. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, even brought near by the blood of Christ. Isn't that amazing? His blood, we celebrated in communion, his body and his blood. That's what brought us near to God again. And then he says this, for himself is our peace who made both into one and broken down the, in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law and commandments expressed in ordinances so that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in, the, in one body through the cross, killing the hostility of whom? Of God towards sin. So that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens of the saints and members of God's household, of God's own household. You see, reconciliation takes us farther than we ever would have dreamed it would take us. We would have been satisfied just to say, I'm forgiven or I have grace, or I'm free. But God says, I'm taking you way farther than that. I'm placing you in a position of my favor, and I'm calling you my sons and daughters. You are children of the Most High God. And that's the position we have in Christ. By this grace of God that he has given us, he has made us alive. Look at this, look at this picture of the things that Ephesians 2 talks about. God made us alive when we were dead. I have to just say hallelujah to that, amen? He made me alive when I was dead. I'm so glad I'm alive today in Jesus. God changes our nature in Christ to be not people who are alienated by him, but people who are in love with him, people who are changed from the inside out by the grace of God. Our relationship with God is renewed. He raises us up to a heavenly position. The dividing one of all of hostility was removed at the cross. We've been bought, brought near to God, and we are now part of God's family. And I have to say hallelujah. Can you say that? Hallelujah. God has changed our position. He has changed our condition. He has changed our relationship by reconciling us through the cross of Jesus Christ. 
That's why we're here this morning. Because we have been given new life. I'm renewed, I'm restored, I'm reborn, I'm reconciled. I'm a new person in Jesus Christ. I'm not who I was. You're not who you were if you're a Christ follower today. And that's the most amazing thing. And I love going back to the cross because it reminds us of what happened there for our sake. Listen to the end of Matthew 27. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. In other words, God said, I'm opening the way for all people to come to me through my son. There's no longer going to be a place in Jerusalem where you have to go to offer sacrifices because the sacrifice of the lamb has once and for all been given. The veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks split, and the tombs that were also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. What a day in Jerusalem, amen? And Jesus had cried out right before he died, it is finished, and that is the result of it. The veil of the temple is torn. There is no longer a need for a sacrificial system. The Lamb of God has been slain once for the world, and that is the reality we live under. And the blood of the Lamb is sufficient for every single sin in every person's life. And death no longer is mastery, and a system no longer holds us, and a relationship is restored to the living God. And when Jesus said it is finished, that meant that your salvation was there completed, and we can receive that by faith. Amen? And that's where we live. And we forget. We forget that it's done. We forget that it was done for us. We forget that that's a position that we are in by the grace of God. And I just want to ask you this morning, are you reconciled? Have you allowed the supernatural ministry of God through Jesus Christ to reconcile you from this position of being in sin to being in Christ and letting that old life wash away under the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ where he reconciled us by his blood? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to tell you, we're persi- we're, we, we get to be a part of this supernatural ministry of Christ because what he does to us, he then can do through us. And not until he does it to you can he really do it through you. And I just want to challenge you this morning to understand that. That if you're trying to forgive people in your own strength, you'll never get it done. If you're trying to extend grace that you don't have in you, you'll never get it done. It will not happen. You'll keep harboring that old bitterness, that old anger, that old frustration, that old separation, you'll keep harboring it for the rest of your life unless you come to the cross. And then from that point, you can find the grace and the forgiveness you need to extend it to other people. So have you allowed the ministry of Christ of reconciliation to touch your heart and change your life? The second thing he says is this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are participants in a supernatural mission of Christ. And this is what it looks like. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Look at that. Or 20 and 21, excuse me. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him who, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We're ambassadors for Christ. We get to participate as a part of the mission of Jesus Christ on the planet, which is the most amazing thing, that he would take us not only from enemies to friendship and to sonship, but then he would say, now I'm making you ambassadors. I'm committing you to a ministry of reconciliation. That's a calling from God on our lives. He commits us to this ministry and says, now you go. As my my ambassadors in this world, you go on my behalf. And that's an amazing thing. See, the mission is to reconcile the world to his life and to his love. And that's the call of God on our lives. The Methodist is church. Now, I think that's pretty crazy, don't you? Think about who's sitting next to you. That they would be an ambassador for Jesus Christ in their world. Think about the person that you are and think, I'm representing Jesus in this world. Would you just look at the person next to you and you say, you represent Jesus in this world. That's ambassadorship. That's this calling of God on our lives. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are people who are called out by God 
to be different than the world, to be people who speak the message of Christ back into the lostness and the deadness where we were, where we are no longer. You see, we forget where we came from. We forget the reconciliation that God has done for us. We get to be participants in the great story of God. You see, his story touched my story, and my story's always changed since then. My story's not the same story it was. And your story's not the same since Jesus came into your life. It cannot be the same. You see, the word ambassadors, it's a key word in the New Testament. The word is pres- presbuo. To be an ambassador, an envoy, a travel, or work as an ambassador. Literally, the phrase would read, on behalf of Christ, we serve as ambassadors. Hyper is a preposition indicating that the activity or event is in some entity's interest for, on behalf of, for the sake of someone or something. It's not for my sake that I'm an ambassador for Christ. It's for his sake that I'm an ambassador for Christ. He calls you out. He calls me out of this world to be people who represent him in the world. And that's why I love what our VBS theme was when he says, I'm special agent on assignment from the one true God, right? That's who we are. We don't have the right to say, I don't want to be an ambassador for you. If you're a Christ follower, you are committed by Christ himself to represent him on the planet, to represent his intentions on the planet. We are people of God. We were not always the people of God, but now we are his people. And so we have this amazing position that God calls us into. As Christ's ambassadors, we represented our king's interests and reflect the values of his kingship and his lordship. We fly a flag over, of his kingdom over our lives and our homes and our marriages and our families and over his church and the world. We fly a flag over our lives that says, Jesus is the rightful king of the universe. We fly a flag of his kingdom. That's what an ambassador does. They go to a foreign country, they fly the flag and represent the values of the king whom they are serving. And we have this position in Jesus Christ to take his mission to the world. And his mission is this. Luke 19, 10 says it this way. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And Luke 15 has three parables. The the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Those are God's stories about life to remind us that we are of incredible value to the Father, that he would search out to find us and restore us to this relationship, that he, we matter to him more than we know, and that we are valuable to the King of Kings. We're valuable to the God of the universe. We represent him on the planet. In John 3, 16 and 17, the whole idea is that we, God God sent his son to the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That is God's mission to save the world from wrath and, and, and consider this reality that we are saved from sin and Satan and death and hell to live a life that pleases God rather than ourselves. We're saved from ourselves as well, which is the most amazing thing to me. We're purposefully missional in all we do in the world. And see, when you think about the missional purpose of Christ in your life, how does that reflect in your neighborhood? How does it reflect in your small group? Do you have a missional sense of community where you're saying, you know what, we want to help other people. We want to show the love of Christ in real life to people. I want to challenge you this year to consider this reality. We need to live on purpose so that people around us see that Christ lives in us and that we represent him in this world. We represent his grace, his compassion, his love, his mercy. We represent his kindness and compassion towards people who are broken and lost and wounded. That's what we do because that's what Christ did. It's purposely miss you. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2. But you are a royal priest and a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We belong to whom? Who do we belong to? We belong to Christ. We belong to God. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And there, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, glorify God in your body because you don't belong to yourself anymore. Last week in part one, I said, your life is none of your business. It's the business of Jesus Christ. And that's the reality that we live in. This is our position. Look what he says our purpose is in that. That you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness to live in his marvelous light. God called you out of darkness, out of the darkness of your sin and out of the deception that you were in to this place of seeing clearly that it is God's work that is going on in my life, that it is God's purpose that is fulfilled in my life, that it is God's work through my life that helps other people to see Jesus and to love him with their one and only life. That's the mission that we're about. And I love the way he says it. 
right in the heart of this passage of Scripture. I want to read it to you one more time. Here's what he says. For, he, for our sake, whose sake? Say it personally, my sake. For my sake, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus knew no sin. He was not a sinner like I'm a sinner, like you were a sinner, like we have been sinners, like the world is sinners. He was not that, but he took on the sin of the world. He became the atoning sacrifice for our sins. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you think that was heavy? No wonder he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the reality was when he took upon himself our sins, that weight of that crushed him. And he died so that we would not have to bear bear the weight of that ourselves, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me ask you something. How righteous is the righteousness of God? From one to 100. 100% righteous, right? God's righteousness is 100%. He is holy without sin. He is separated from sinners. He is a holy God. He is completely righteous in all his ways, the scripture says, right? When God says to us, You might become the righteousness of God. Let me tell you something, friend. If you're a believer here, if you're a Christ follower here, and the blood of Jesus has washed out your sin, you are 100% righteous in the sight of God. And you still will deal with the guilt for that thing you did 10 years ago, and the shame that you felt when you committed that sin that you know was heinous to yourself and other people and wounded people. You still hold on to things in your past that you will not let go of, even though God says in Psalm 103 that we, that as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us, and we still hold on to the guilt and the shame and the condemnation that comes with that when he says, at the cross, he took it all so that you could be the righteousness of God, so you could be holy in the sight of God. And when he sees you, he sees himself. He sees his righteousness. And we ought to just say hallelujah to that. Because I'm set free. You're set free. And the things that we hold on to are not what God wants us to hold on to at all. He wants us to be free to live and to love and to celebrate this reality that we are free in Jesus Christ and righteous in the sight of a holy God and that he's pleased with our stumbles and he loves us more than life. And we forget that, don't we? El Gabor, he's called the mighty God. And that word means God, our hero. And when he took upon himself the sin of this world, mine included, he became the hero of my life and the hero of my future and the hero of everything I live for. He is my hero. Because what he did for me, I could never have done for myself. What he did for you, you could never have done for yourself. You could not take upon yourself your sin and pay the price for it because it's death and you wouldn't be here, right? And the reality of it is he did that for us because he is God, our hero. And look at what he says about it in in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, not to make it of no purpose, not to live like it doesn't make a difference. Because in order to understand reconciliation and grace that way, you have to understand that it cost Jesus his life. He gave up his life. He bled on the cross. He died for our sins. He took upon himself our punishment so that we could not experience it, so we'd experience the grace and goodness and mercy of God in our life today. And he did that for us. He said, don't receive it and make it to no purpose because the grace of God is the greatest thing you've ever received. You have never received a greater favor from God than to say to you, I wash out your sins. I give you new life. I come and make you, declare you righteous in my sight because you matter to me more than life. You're valuable to me more than life itself, infinitely valuable to me. My blood on the cross proves that. More than ever, that's a relevant message for our culture, isn't it? That the God of the universe loves you more than life. That you matter to him. That now is the day of God's favor. Look what he says. In a favorable time I listened to you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is a favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. When is that? Say that again. Like you believe it. Now. Now. 
It changes our lives today. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of the, that God wants to bring us to wholeness and forgive our sins and restore us to sonship. You see, we are proclaimers of a supernatural message. Now is the day, not someday. What if now is the day? I love Luke chapter 4, Jesus speaking in the, in the temple in, in uh, Nazareth, in the, in the uh, synagogue in Nazareth. Look what he says. Luke chapter 4. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and it is, is his custom. He went to the synagogue on a Sabbath day and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Does that sound like anybody you know? And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor that God is for us. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him and he began to say to them, today, what day is that? Today, that scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, the favor of God has come to men. Today, we live in the age of grace. Because when Jesus came and lived and died and rose again, he extended to us this amazing grace of God that changes us forever, that gives us this favor with God. And it is an amazing place to be. He brings us from brokenness to wholeness. That is what salvation means. It bringing us back and restoring to us and in us the image of God, the God that created us, male and female. That is being restored in us day by day. And that's the reality that we live in. You see, this favor of God is the most amazing thing. And I love that Luke 4 passage because my daughter is now a Christian counselor, a counselor for Western Psychological in Portland. She's 25 years old. I know she was 13 when we got here. Do you, remember, do you believe that? Now she's trying to fix the family. <laughs> Go figure that out. And I always tell her, I always tell her about the Luke 4 passage. Remember, you're a compassionate caregiver to people, but you're the helper. And Jesus Christ is the healer because only Jesus can heal our lives. Nobody, other people can help you compassionately. They can care about you. They can give you wisdom and counsel. But Jesus Christ is the healer of every life on this planet. That's what he offers us. And that's what I love about that Luke 4 passage. That's what I love about the idea that he tells us about the, 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 this idea of the year of the Lord's favor. The year of Jubilee was a year in the history of Israel. They were promised that in the 50th year, seven times seven years, perfect numbers of God. The 50th year was a year where they gained their freedom, where they, their debts were forgiven, where their property was concerned, returned to their owners, where they got to celebrate the reality that they were free from debt and free to be back where they ought to be and free from all those things that held them back and captivated their lives. Sounds like a country song played backwards, doesn't it? You get back your dog, you get back your house, you get back your wife, you get back your car or truck. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's a truck. It's a truck. Got to have a truck thing. You see, the year, of, the year of Jubilee is a special year, the acceptable year of the Lord, which, which was, is being described by Jesus and Luke. It was to be spiritually brought to pass through him. It was what Isaiah was prophesying. Jesus fulfilled or will fulfill all the feast days. Steve was talking about those three major feast days. This is the other one. This is the 50th year one, as well as the spiritual intent of the year of Jubilee, which is to set the captives free from their de indebtedness, to set the captives free from their, their blindness, to set the captives free and restore them to a position of sonship and daughtership of the Most High God, where His kingdom is our kingdom forever. That's the celebration that we live with. See, the problem is the world is dead wrong. They're dead in their sins. They're separated from the life of God. And they believe the great lies of Satan. And the great lies of Satan look something like this. Wherever that is. It's not me, by the way. <laughs> all the money in the world and all the sexual experiences in the world and all the pleasure in the world and all the success and victory in the world and all the popularity in the world and all the beauty and the fame in the world. And you are still what? You're still dead. You're still dead in your sins without Jesus. You're still dead and separated from God. And the reality of it is we need to learn how to speak the, and proclaim the word of life to people in our world. We need to live this out in such a way that they hear it and see it by our lives. 
They hear it and see it. It's show and tell time, folks. It's time for us to get up and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are free, and you can be too. Because that's our purpose in this world. Steve said years ago, he said, God left us here for one of two reasons. Either we continue to sin or we try to win the world in his name. What do you think he left us here for? He left us here so that we could proclaim the greatness of our God to a world that is still dead in their sins. And I want to ask you this morning about this reality. You see, we are made alive in Christ to share our supernatural, purposeful lives of grace and truth and love and freedom and joy. We're made alive for the purpose of God restoring us so that we can help restore others. Are you living on purpose? Are you saying to the world you matter to the Father in heaven more than life? Are you telling them that Jesus loves them today in your neighborhood, in your relationships with people who don't know him yet? Are you helping people to understand that they are eternally and perfectly loved by our God and that there is in Jesus Christ the answer to every single question they have about life and purpose and meaning and their future? Are you living on purpose? Because God is very purposeful about what he has done so that we can do that, isn't he? And that's why he calls us up and out as a church to live on purpose in this world. In the name of Jesus, for the glory of God, so that people are drawn to him through us. Let's pray. Father, we want to love you this morning by our lives. We want to love you with our lives. We want to remember that it cost you your life to give your life for us. We want to remember, Jesus, that you gave your life freely because you valued us more than life itself. And Lord, today we just want to ask you to work in our lives in the name of your Son to bring us to this new place of being ambassadors of the Most High God, of being people who live out this ministry of Christ and proclaim it to the world around us that they need to know there is hope and life and love in one place that lasts forever. It's in Jesus, your Son. And we come in His name.